Hi everybody. I would like to start by showing you this image and asking you if you know what these animals are and if you know what they have in common. Um, I'm sure everyone putting up now the nativity scene is familiar with the first one. So this is a mule. Um, it's a crossing between a donkey and a horse. And if you're one of those who, during the pandemic, like me, watch Tiger King, you might remember the liger, which is a crossing between a lion and a tiger. And what they have in common is that the fact that they're hybrids. So they're, a cross, they're the offspring of a crossing between two different species. And hybrids are really cool, actually, because in their DNA, we can find signatures of uh, both of the, the parents. So for example, the mule from its parent horse, it inherits uh, speed and agility. And from its parent donkey, it inherits endurance, disposition, and strength, to the point that the mule is able to outperform, to do better than their parents in certain situations. And this is something that we call hybrid bigger. And, um, sorry. And so um, we find examples of hybrids in animals, in plants, and also we find hybrids in different organisms. And for example, is the fungi. And I know that when I say fungi, the brain of most people go here to this kind of fungi, but I'm actually referring to fungal microbes, and in particular, a group of them that are candida species. So these candida uh, species are pathogens, and this means that they can cause disease to us, and they're actually responsible for about 50,000 deaths a year, and the WHO has put them in the high and critical priority groups. And it turns out that some of these um, candida species are hybrids as well. But the problem here is that a hybrid cell looks like this, and a non-hybrid cell looks like this, so they're identical. And people had been studying them for years, not even having a clue that they were looking at a hybrid. It was only when we started to sequence the genomes and analyze them, when we can see their true colors and we can distinguish between a hybrid cell and a non-hybrid cell. Um, so in this sort of family tree, I'm showing you different candida species and their relationship. I know they have very funny names, don't even try to remember them. What I want you to know is that the four top species are human pathogens, so they can cause disease to humans, and the top three are hybrids. So actually the picture looks a bit more like this. So in purple you can see the hybrids that come from the crossing between one parent in blue and another parent in red. And the first thing that you may notice is that there's a lot of question marks. This is because we have no clue who the parents are, and this makes the study of the hybrids a lot trickier. Um, and the second thing that we've noticed is that all the samples that we have, they come from the hospital, they come from sick patients, and all of these samples are hybrids. So we thought, well, maybe the parents are not there because they're not able to cause infections to humans. And um, so we have this question of who are these parents and where are they? So we thought, okay, they're not in the clinic, so they must be maybe somewhere in the environment. So we started looking for isolates that were coming from the environment, specifically from the, from the sea, from very warm waters, around 35, 38, 40 degrees. And we got some isolates that came from Bahamas, Thailand, Qatar. Now, unfortunately, I was not the person going there and doing the sampling. But I'm trying to work on that for future projects. Um, but basically what we saw is that most of these samples were also hybrids. So the hybrids are so much better than the parents, not only at hospitals, but also in the environment. Um, but there was one exception, one exception only. And to our amusement and delight, um, that exception was this guy here. So now for this family, for the first time, we have a complete overview of the genomic evolution of this species with the two parents and four different groups of hybrids that arise from four independent hybridization events. And what this means is that this was not a one-night stand. These two parents did it at least four times, and their offspring, these hybrids, are so successful they've been found all over the world. And very important here is that the samples that we got from the environment, they don't form a separate group, but they're very closely related to the samples that we have uh, from the clinics. So 
Now that we have, this is just an easier representation of what I showed you before, now that we have the whole family around the table, we can ask questions about this hybrid vigor that I was telling you at the beginning. Um, so we want to know why these hybrids are so much better in infecting humans than in the parents. Um, so healthy humans are generally quite good at fighting uh, fungal infections, and one of the reasons why is because we have a high body temperature, and that makes our bodies a bit of a, an inhospitable place for this fungi to live. So we wanted to test how these guys grow at high temperatures, and we realized that the parent A um, were like, no, I'm not having that. They were not able to grow at high temperature. On the other hand, parent B were so good are growing at high temperatures, they were able to grow even at 42 degrees, and we found that the hybrids are sort of like in the middle. They have this intermediate behavior that we think that's crucial for adaptation to um, live inside the human host and to infect us. Um, I know I've told you many things, but I'm hoping that um, you remember a couple. Um, first of all, that fungal pathogens, even though they're not as famous as bacteria or viruses, they also represent an important um, threat to the human health. Also, that they can be um, found literally floating in the environment, and that this process of hybridization um, influences the emergence of these new pathogens. However, to the question of why exactly are these hybrids so much better than the parents and infecting us, um, we still don't know. And this is why it's crucial that we carry on doing the research that we're doing. And I'm going to stop here. Um, I would like to give a huge thanks to everybody in the group, especially to our group leader, Tony Gabaldon, marked there with the red arrow, um, to the BSC for letting me share with you a glimpse of uh, my work today, uh, to funding sources, and all of you for your attention. Thank you very much.